episode of our podcast, I have a really special guest today. Uh, today we're talking with Jake. Jake is a serial entrepreneur, blogger, and creator. He's also the host of the podcast Working Without Pens, which is amazing. I was listening to a few episodes last weekend and I loved it. Um, he also owns two companies, Lead Cookie, which does lead generation, and he has scale to over $600,000 per year. And another company that I don't want to mention because we're kind of competitors. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> the other company is Content Alice, which they do content creation for and turning experts into thought leaders. Today, we're going to be talking about sales, marketing, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me on the show, Marty. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the things that really caught my eye was uh, your podcast. I think you had over 160 episodes. This podcast that we have started right now is pretty young. We're still in season one. And so I was wondering, what advice do you have for me to grow your podcast and make it sustainable over the long term? Yeah, I think the the biggest things I've found is, um, A, I just like, the value is just insane. Um, like the, I've at one point, um, I don't know if it still exists today. Today it's kind of my podcast has kind of morphed in with my personal brand and all this stuff. But at one point I measured and over 50% of all of my company's revenue was a result of the podcast in some capacity. Wow. And uh, so that was like either relationship, it's not all like, and, they have, and like what everyone thinks when they think of podcasting is like, oh, I'm going to build an audience and then these people will come and inquire, but that's not always how it works. Like a lot of times, like the people that I interviewed would then like interview me and put me in front of their audience or they would become customers or they would like, we just build a friendship through the interview and then they would refer me to others. So it's like, I was like a podcasting as like this networking tool. And it was honestly probably like two years in before I started being like, Oh wow. The podcast content itself is driving customers, right. but the relationships driving customers that happened really fast. That um, and so that was really one of the interesting things. I, I think I call it like an, an excuse for networking because yeah. people are not, <laughs> you cannot approach cold people and tell them, Hey, can we spend 30 minutes talking about nothing? But when you tell them, Hey, you want to jump on my podcast, they, they, they sound much more exciting. And then you can build that relationship. Right. Yeah. And, and the crazy thing, like this other like benefit, like, it's like you're getting free consulting from smart people all right. the time. Like I swear, like I have made massive business moves because I just get someone who like, like my, how I choose guests for podcasts is I'm like, who's doing what I want to be doing. Okay. Let me interview them and then ask them their entire story and all of the things that I'm curious about. And so like I, whenever I started my content agency, I interviewed like 12 content agencies Right. And like, it's just like, <laughs> like, how else could I do that? You know? So yeah, these are like if you're the listening to this podcast, ones. I got to say, I'm sorry. Cause I'm asking the most selfish questions that I can. Cause I ask questions that I want to know. And hopefully if you're listening, this also gives value to you. But like you said, it's like free coaching and consulting. Exactly. That's the thing. Like my mentality is like, if I'm learning and getting value out of the interview, then my audience probably is as well. Other but like the involved. times when I like used to just be like, try to like come out with the questions and like feature their story or unique angle. I was like, ah, it just doesn't feel exciting. But if I just go where I'm curious, like, and I want to know from them, like then I know that I'm going to pull some good stuff out of that. Right. Because how long have you been, when did you start the podcast? I think it was four to five years ago. Um, wow. There were some periods where I did take breaks. Right. Um, but just kind of have kept it going. Um, but yeah, it's been about four to five years. It started as a totally different thing and evolved into that where it is. Evolved. So, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I found really interesting is how the two companies that you, that you run right now are, are in different spaces, right? Like lead cook is more in the, in the sales space versus content analysis, more on the marketing and content side. Um, so this is one of the things that we usually tend to see a fight between inside companies between budgets and between which one should we over index on um, sales or marketing, right? So how do you see that fight or how do you find that balance or, or how do you think companies should find that balance when it comes to, to these opposed kind of uh, scenarios? Yeah, it's just something where, again, I, it really is a balance. Um, you know, within most um, companies, like, you know, what we've seen at Lead Cookie was when someone has content, like, they're going to perform better because when you do outreach, you do cold outreach of any type, people research you. Um, right. It is like, we have tons of stories of like, it is like 
the people research and like you just reach out to someone cold and they're not like, oh, your value message was written so well that I'm going to now hire your company without doing background and just give money to some <laughs> well-written email on the internet. Like that's not how it works. They're like, okay, that value proposition is interesting. Let me look at this guy. Let me see what he's doing. Let me see what their company is, what content that they have. And the more of that you have backing it up, the more success you have. And our biggest wins at Lead Cookie were always customers that had good content resources, good things to back up their outreach campaigns. Um, and and I just get it. It just goes a super long way. Yeah, especially I think if if you're doing outreach and they have already seen your name and consumed your content, even if they have not came inbound yet, but it's not the same as cold emailing or cold DMing somebody when they have already seen your name. Yeah, it's crazy from when I do my own outreach, I'll have people that like know my name from my content. Right. And like the outbound will convert, which I'm like, that's interesting because like you're kind of, I guess, like it just was happened to be that like my outreach landed with someone who is actually also like read my stuff and seen my name before. But that's this cool side benefit where like it converts better as well. And and you started with uh, Lead Cookie, which was more of a sales oriented uh, company. And now you made this change or now you're starting over the last year with Content Alice. Why did you make that switch towards content and, and shying away a bit from, from the outreach part? Yeah, so there's a handful of things. I think the biggest thing is just the outbound industry that where the trends are going. Mm -hmm. um, you're looking at LinkedIn is basically like owning a ton of the outreach space. And then you also have Outlook and Gmail, which have made deliverability significantly harder. Right. Um, and so I look at like where the outbound industry is going to be in the next five years. It's just going to get harder. And it's like, and it's a good thing. It's forcing like, like I'll be honest, three years ago, I was a professional spammer <laughs> and I've had, we've had to evolve as the technology platforms have forced us to evolve, to do higher quality, lower quantity, which is good. It's like what the world needs, but it's also really hard to scale a business in a very low volume, high quality kind of way. And so we're, we're kind of getting pushed more to, into being just like a high quality agency, which is great. And we're doing, we're honestly doing better results for our clients than we ever have. But in terms of scaling a company there, it's like, ah, this is, it's not scalable. So then there's this kind of framework that I, I feel like is really great for anyone who's like a marketing professional. It's like, instead of trying to build a marketing company, what if you just used your marketing skills to build a company that's not in the marketing industry? And so that's what I'm kind of doing. I started this first shift and content allies was that first approach because I see content as being far more stable. And now I'm even having some other business kind of concepts that I'm basically using lead cookie to launch and sell and get out into the marketplace. Um, and so it's kind of that idea of using your skills to build businesses that are not based around your skills. If that's, you know, a, a challenging space. Because it's interesting how I think last time we spoke, you already mentioned that lead cook is actually one of the ways or one of the main ways really that you generate business for content alley. So it, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship where both grow from each other. Yeah. I honestly, like we had done so many outbound campaigns for content companies and we're like, this works every time. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> so why don't I start a content company instead of just like getting, you know, like a small amount of money and then signing these content agencies up all these new customers. I was like, why don't I just start my own? Like, <laughs> right. and uh, th that's where it was, which, you know, easier said than done. There's a lot of challenges to a content company as I've learned, but I had a, you know, a predictable sales engine from day one. And one of the things that really caught my eye when I was learning more about lead cookie as well is how you guys can kind of see which campaign is going to perform well versus which one is not through how well defined is their value proposition. So I wanted to see if you could speak a bit more about that. Yeah, the, the big thing just I think, and I think this applies to anything with marketing, but it's like very fast data mm -hmm. when you're running an outbound campaign. Like with content, you know, it's the same. If you were to have like a poor value proposition and be like, oh, I'm going to write content about like web design, like for any business in the world, like it's like, well, that's probably not going to resonate or do that much for you. But right. You know, if you went like niche or anything like that and you were like, oh, we're going to talk about like the website structures for like, B2B SaaS companies on their like product pages or something like then like you're getting like really focused toward an audience and it's the same with outbound but the interesting thing with outbound is like you get feedback on if your value proposition resonates in like the first 30 days much quicker 
right. yeah, content, you're going to like do this for years and it's never going to be like, oh, crickets is just going to like kind of not work as well. But it's like, oh, we clearly, we either got 20 responses this month or we got two. Like <laughs> it's very quantifiable. Um, and that's the cool thing about outbound. And so as our team, um, the way we look at it is we do like these very win-win relationships where we have our 30 day money back guarantee. And we're like, mm -hmm. if we are not, if you're like, you know, you're not going to close a deal in 30 days, but if you're not getting good leads and responses in those first 30 days, then like, you know, we'll refund your money back because we only want to take on campaigns. We're confident we'll succeed. Makes sense. And now that we're talking about sales, I read a blog post on your website, which is packed of them um, about one of the, let's call it mistakes about handing off sales and delegating sales a bit too early. And I thought that was a very interesting story that I think people can really get value from. So if you can tell me when, how that happened, or tell me a bit more about that story and, and what you learned from that. Yeah. So basically like one of the biggest mistakes that I made the first time I tried to hand off sales mm -hmm. and I just see so many people make uh, is basically like, you're like, Oh, like I want to get out of sales Right. And so like, I want to just hand that off and delegate that like any other role at the company. And I was, you know, delegating off all this op stuff and it was going great. So I was like, Oh, cool. I'll get like sales. But sales is something where it is a lot more, um, it's a lot more skill driven. Mm -hmm. And especially in a service company, um, yeah, where sure. if you're doing anything like that, where it's not like, Oh, just taking orders, it's consultative. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the first thing time I handed over sales, like it was honestly really loose. And what you don't realize is like, um, my business advisors, Alex McClafferty talks about like the master splinter concept. So you got like master splinter at the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and he tells them to go do something. And then they all just are idiots and they screwed up and he's like, Oh, you know, like, <laughs> but it's like this thing where you're like, you don't realize the inherent knowledge you have and you're bringing to those conversations, um, until you try to hand it to someone. And then they just like, blow it and then you're like holy crap like this there's so much that it's not as easy as just like handing over like do this process it is much more qualitative and so uh the first time i handed it off was a complete failure literally our sales plummeted i had to lay off six people it was horrible wow. uh so there's also very heavy costs of screwing right. this up and the second time i handed it over like i had turned into a robot like i was just <laughs> showing up on calls and it was just like, this is how you close deals. And, and it was like very systematic, very repetitive. I had optimized everything. I'd put like Zapier's in place. I had built forms to like input new customers into the system and how I was going to communicate that from sales to the ops team. And then the only like qualitative thing was like deciding, are they a good fit or not? Right. Like that was the only thing that I really had to train and advise on and really get someone up to speed on, but we could like have those conversations or you could say, Hey, let me think on this. I'll talk with uh, the team and we'll get back to you. Um, but that was like, I removed as much of that as I could. So there was like the smallest amount of qualitative decisions to still make. So that's, that's interesting how you are, are taking that. And I'm guessing that's one of the things that you're going to apply with content analysis moving forward. Right. Cause this is like the second time that you're building, um, uh, a marketing related business. Um, so what are the other things that you are doing differently this time around? Yeah, probably one of the other biggest things I did differently is uh, I have never written an article for us. Okay. Uh, like, you know, we do article writing and social posts. I've never created one for a customer. Right. And part of that is like, you know, I don't know if everyone's capable of that, but when, like, when we started lead cookie, it was like day one, like we signed a customer and like, I'm sending connections. Like <laughs> that was like, you know, and like that was day one, but, um, with content analyze part of it, just the fact that I have cash flow runway from another company, I was like, all right, I'm going to hire someone from day one to do the things that I, I hate, which is anything repetitive or operational. So did and, you hire them full time or, or as a freelancer at the beginning? Uh, so she was basically, um, already part-time with lead cookie. Okay. And so we kind of just slowly shifted her over from like off of her lead cookie responsibilities into content allies responsibilities. So it was probably like a three month shift, but even though it wasn't full-time, I still had someone there from day one. So I guess she, she wasn't full-time. She was part-time on it, 
still doing other work. It just happened to be with Lead Cookie, but that she also had another freelance client at that point too. So gotcha. it wasn't even a ton, but it was just like, hey, I'm going to build this. You're going to run ops and like it's going to grow over time and kind of thing. And just like, I'm just going to throw things at you and I'm going to coach you and teach you how to run these things, but you're going to run them. Right. And uh, so that was like a, a big difference the second time around, which I feel like, I feel like it just changes things. Cause or, I don't know, like you, when you, when you do the work yourself, you start to like kind of ingrain your like consultingness into it. Uh, first, when you never do the work yourself, you're like, how do I fix this as a system and a company? And it's like, if our work writing quality is like not up to par at some point, it's like, it's not on me. It's like, how do I fix this as a system? So right. <laughs> that's very interesting because I'm at a point in my business where while I'm not doing the content creation myself, I'm still like the editor in a way. Um, and I don't think I have pulled myself away with, and being of, a, of an architect of the machine, right? And, and looking at the machine system. So it's very interesting to me how the second time you already had that from day one, right? Like I'm not going to be inside, I'm going to be out and then I'm going to be helping how I can, but I'm not going to be involved on the day to day or content creation and all that. Yeah. And it's, again, I think it's, there are, there's the reality of just having the resources to be able right. to do that. But I think there's also the reality, like partially because I like kind of got scarred on that lead cookie, like that layoff <laughs> one, like I then held on to account strategy and I held on to sales longer than I needed to mm -hmm. because I was afraid of like letting them go again. And so I think there's a big, like when you are like, the quality of everything coming out of your company is dependent on you. Like it's kind of scary to put that off, but at some point like you become a bottleneck and you have too much on your plate and you being in that role is going to mean like that the quality suffers. And there's like this, there's, it's hard to tell this and you kind of got to like predict it, but there's some point where there was some point where I was like, I know we're not making as many sales as we could because I'm in the sales seat and I don't follow up with anybody because I don't have time. <laughs> and I was like, if I had someone fully dedicated to this, like right. they will probably close more deals than they did. Like whenever we got them ramped up and it's the same with like quality of output. It's like, if I were still editing, overseeing all of that, like that would probably not be a good thing because I would be so busy that I would not be really giving it the critical eye that it needs when someone's like fully dedicated to that kind of role. And I think that those people that are fully dedicated, I think they can even be even better than ourselves, right? I oh, yeah. Maybe as an entrepreneur, I think there's a sense of arrogance that we have of like, I'm going to be able to do this no matter what, and I'm good enough to take care of X, Y, Z. But we, and this might be more of a self-reflection, but I think we need to fully understand that there's people better than us at doing X, while we're doing so many things that we cannot focus on X and doing it hundred percent versus them doing X all the time and, and just being better than us. Right. Yeah. One of the things my advisor always told me is like, you're the worst person for every job. And right. you have to realize that like <laughs> your goal as an entrepreneur is just to fire yourself from everything and do nothing eventually, which like <laughs> there's, there's a long road to get to that. Um, right. But like, it's really interesting when like you hit that point, like, and that's, you know, I've, I'm fortunate that I've like gotten to that with lead cookie. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like the industry was like, I built this whole thing up and then the end, like the market shifts were just like, Hey, we're going to destroy it. We're gonna break <laughs> <the thing up. laughs> but uh, it was like, I did get to a point where it was like, I literally work like four to five hours a week on this company. And I have people owning all the key roles except for marketing and lead gen, which again, my personal brand or my podcast drives a lot of that but like I've got people that own everything else and that's right. a really cool spot to realize that like they all do better. Like I have sometimes people that come through my personal brand and they're like, well, like, will you like kind of look at strategy and like for us and like kind of be involved. And I'm like, my team is better at me than this these right. days. Like I, I literally won't do a good job. Like <laughs> You don't so, want me to be there for you. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. And it's like, it's hard for people to realize that, but it's like, no, I swear they're better than me. <laughs> So, so as a segue from, from what I was actually meaning to ask you, but tell me about how valuable has been your personal brand. Cause that's one of the things that I have invested myself over the last year, two years, and, and that I want to keep investing in for the next 10 years, 20 years. But tell me about the value that it has brought to yourself, to the company, being able to like create, creating content for your, for your personal brand and growing that. 
Yeah, it's, it's insane. Like I said, the podcast at one point I measured was over 50% of revenue. About a year ago, I measured just personal brand as a whole, mm-hmm. and it was over 68% of revenue. Wow. was a result of my personal brand for just lead cookie. And that's not even to count like the fact that I would say at least 40 to 50% of content allies is from personal mm-hmm. brand. Right. Um, and then what's like super cool, it's like, it's just like having a personal brand is awesome because it's just this asset you build. And like, I just have an email list now that I can just launch things to and like see if they work. Right. And it's like, I swear it's like cheating at business. Um, <laughs> like I'm, I, got, I, have, I have a technical co-founder now for um, kind of a software product that I'm building for agencies to like send and receive passwords safely online um, to get them from clients. And I like, he's kind of on, he's on board because it's like, well, I've got an email list of 7,000 agencies that I can like get this to. So like, we're probably going to be able to sign up our initial user base really quickly. Right. And so like, as you build this up and you have this authority and you have like relationships and you have a brand where like, if I see an influencer, like I can probably go interview them unless they're like the top, top tier of influencers. But anyone that's like B level or below, like I can pretty much reach out and interview them on my podcast and most of them will say yes. Yeah. And like, that is just, that's where it's just like cheating. I talk to friends without personal brands and they're trying to run their businesses and I'm just like, they're like, how do I do this? I'm like, well, you should probably like start a podcast now. So you have a tool to like network with these people later. Cause like, I just go interview people and like talk to them. Like, so (laughs) yeah. What about in terms of timeline? How long did it take you to like start seeing results? Yeah. So like it was like intermittent, like I technically started my personal brand like seven, eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And it was literally like when I was like 22 or something, 23. And I was just like, had my first video agency. And I was just like writing these weird emotional posts of like a young twenties angst. Like yeah. and it was I mean, just like I'm 23 was, right now. And I, I relate to that. So yeah. Yeah. And like, and like, so I don't really, it was like not actually valuable to anybody. Like it was just right. like putting stuff, but I like started doing it. And, um, and then there, there was years where I stopped, uh, mm-hmm. at one point I let my, my domain name lapse. And so now I have to have Jake dash Jorgovin.com because <laughs> someone poached that shit. Uh, <laughs> so That's uh, like it wasn't fully consistent, but it was probably about five years ago when I like the big turning point was me when I said, Hey, I'm going to publish every week. Right. And I like wrote articles every week and published every week for like six months. And then I launched the podcast, added that to the mix. And then there were still times where like things were up or down or crazy. And I like let it go for six, nine months at a time. Of course. And most recently I let it go for about three months last year. And like lead cookies revenue, like went down, tanked. And That's like, we crazy. like took a loss for a month and I was like, holy shit. Like I can't <laughs> stop this. Like I have to keep this going. Like I didn't realize how powerful that this right. was until I like stopped it now and realized just all the benefits. Cause it's, it's not always just like someone coming through. It's just like the referrals, the word of mouth that all creates. It's, mm-hmm. it's so hard to track until you stop doing it and you see things go down and you're like, Oh wait, like, cause it's just, it creates, it's like so organic, the results right. it creates. And one of the things that I, I, you mentioned before that we tell our clients as well is how it's a built in audience. It comes with you wherever you go. So like, if you want to start another company, they come with you, right? You have an email list of a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand 10,000 people. Those are the people that are going to be there for you when you're launching something and you want to test it, right? Or whatever you want to do, whether it's you want to refer, start sending referrals to other people, that's your audience that, that follows you everywhere you go. And, and that's a long lasting relationship. It's not just for the company that you have today, but it's a company that you might have 10 years from today. Yeah. I only look at, I look at like Nathan Barry with convert kit and I have followed right. him since before he ever started convert kit. And it's just like, I think I'm going to switch from drip to convert kit. And it's like, part of it's cause like, I like, I love this it's guy's him. stuff and, and right? like, and drips getting expensive. And I'm like, and they're kind of shifting toward e-commerce. So I'm like, I'm looking to switch. I'm like, I well, like, I believe in the direction this guy's going. Yeah. So I know his product's going to continue to be great. So And, and it's just more personal, right? Because at the end of the day, like my company, Influence Podium, it's a logo. Nobody cares about my logo, but they might care about me or, mm-hmm. or same, same with you, right? So at the end of the day, the, the personal relationship that you build with a personal brand is that much more powerful that you can build with a company. Yep, very true. So one of the things that going back to, to the sales and the marketing part, 
how, how, is, how has it been different to sell content marketing services with content analysis versus the immediate gratification that comes with lead gen and lead cooking? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just like the urgency and the pace of business. Right. Like lead cookie, like, like if you, there's like digital marketer did a survey last year. It's like, what do you want most as like a small business owner or a market? Everyone's like leads. Right. And it's like at the top of like, it's like the biggest thing. And like, so it's like the easiest thing to sell. Mm-hmm. It also has an insanely high level of churn. Um, just because like people just switch around lead gen tactics and providers so much that even if you're doing great, like they'll eventually churn off or stuff like that. And so it's just, it's easy to sell. And then, like I said, like you see results in 30 days, you know, 30 days, if this thing's going well with content, it's like, it's never, no one's ever like content is my number one priority. Like it just never is like, because it's the long-term thinking, like anyone that's going into content knows that this is long-term game. You can, Mm -hmm. you can know, you can position this as we're going to create assets for your sales team, kind of have you have quicker wins, but like it's most people, it's like a longer term vision and so it's never top of priority which means deals close way slower and also just like it's just less uh i guess urgent for people and then also like people's pace of working with you and like seeing the um the results like i actually had a call with anthony yesterday and i'm like i feel like i make a tweak in the business and i don't know if it's going to work for like three months right whereas lead cookie was like make a tweak find out results in like two to three weeks. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, Oh, I'm going to try this new pricing package. Okay. I'm going to sell this now. And I'll sell like one or two of these because it sells slower. And then like three or four months down the line, I'd be like, did that work? And like, it's just <laughs> such a, it's so slow paced, which is kind of, there's beauty in that. I love how it's not as like, there's not fires every day in this right. business model, but there's also just a, a slower pace of learning. I feel like as well. And what's the number one objection you're seeing when when you're on the sales process? What's the one thing that most prospects come to you? Yeah, I'd say like I big call again. I worked with Anthony yesterday, and I think we're just we're making some shifts. And I I think the biggest thing for me is that I positioned my target persona of going after. I was going after consultants for mm-hmm. about the first year of this business which like the value proposition resonates consultants are really smart expert people in some niche area that they're probably the smartest in the world at. So like, it makes sense for them to do content, but um, they just never have the time. Right. And even when we would get them to sign up, they just wouldn't dedicate the time or they'd reschedule or cancel our calls. And so that was probably our biggest challenge, which I think was heavily related to the persona that, loved the value prop in theory, but struggled to actually execute, execute. Uh, and, and work with us in the long term. So I've uh, recent learnings literally like the, the past couple of weeks here that yeah, I'm just like, I gotta good. ditch this. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that comes with content that I've been thinking a lot lately, because my company so far only takes care of the content creation part, but doesn't take care. And I've been thinking how we can play into that of the distribution. So we obviously schedule and publish our clients' content, but how about paid distribution? How do you think about making sure the right people see con- your content at scale or your clients' content at scale? And not just organic, but also via paid. Yeah, I'll be honest, it's something we're not diving into too much right now. Like I feel like I want to evolve to that. Some of the you know Influence & Co is a really big company that I recently interviewed on my podcast and they very much pair their content and creation with PR campaigns and they but like just like I get in my curiosity of the interview I was like how do you guys do this and like right. what does that look like and and it's clear like they've built up relationships with all of these editors for these major publications and then they're constantly trying to get their clients pitched so it's like they have like a PR division on right. top of their content division and I'm like yeah. well that's cool but a lot to a lot to build there yeah. and like currently out of my capabilities so i'm just, I'm just focusing on the content as it is for right now and trying to find partnerships or stuff in that realm but right. uh it's it's an interesting angle that i'm looking to solve but taking it one step at a time yeah what do you think about pr what, what are your thoughts on pr because i have very sp- specific thoughts but I, so i want to hear what what you're thinking about how if you think it's necessary or when do you think it's necessary right now especially in b2b business 
and, and what role do you think it plays out? I think for, I think it is definitely valuable. Um, and it's like what people want, especially like, like ultimately people like the reality is like someone gets in like Inc. for the entrepreneur. I know tons of people. They're like, it never actually drives that many business results, that, but then you can put I, it on my, your website. Yeah. You, you can put it on your website and it looks legit. And then you're going to get more deals and opportunities or more trust as a result. So it's like this giant, just like trust thing. Right. And, um, and so again, I don't think it drives that much. I think PR as a whole, like I think podcasting is a much better angle if you want to grow your business mm -hmm. than hiring a PR firm. But the the social credibility and the social proof that PR can bring can be good. But the old fashioned model of PR, these like we're going to charge ten thousand dollars a month that's, and like offer you no like promises. It's like that's bullshit. I think it's like <laughs> broken because I I've been fantasizing about like using the anti-PR content marketing firm as a tagline for my agency because I <laughs> personally hate PR. I think, so you go to Forbes and there's articles that they allow you to see how many views they're getting. And these articles are getting like 300 views, 200 views max. And yeah, because Forbes doesn't actually push them. They just, right. they just want you, the, the writer, to push your audience and get more clicks on their site. They don't care. And I think it's the middleman, right? At the end of the day, right now, you don't need Forbes to allow you to create content. You can mm -hmm. have your own blog. You can, like the value you're getting from your podcast, it will be super expensive to get from a PR firm. Yeah, right? I so totally agree. I think the, we can cut the middleman nowadays, especially in terms of content creation. Yeah, and it's what's screwed up is like, me off to see people yeah. pay 15k a month for two Forbes articles that nobody sees. What's crazy is I've got friends that they're like, I can get you guaranteed in Forbes three articles for three grand. And I'm just like, right. it's just pay to play market. Like right. what the hell? <laughs> like, it's like, do you have the money to get your name listed on Forbes? Like that's what it's coming into these days. And I'm Cause, like, Cause that's why at the end of the day, it's not even a trust sign. Cause if you can pay to be in it, then it's just because you were in it, I don't trust you. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it just, I get the unfortunate part is lots of the world doesn't understand that. Like yeah. we're in the world. So we know it, but most people are like, Oh, Forbes, mm, oh, Forbes. They, they're they're, cool. they must be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And one of the other buzzwords that I think there's a lot in content marketing is you have to put it. I hear this a lot. You have to put out valuable content and that adds value. And I think we all have different definitions of what adding value really means. And as somebody that has been creating a lot of content for a lot of years, what do you think for you is valuable content? I think the biggest thing is just to teach your best insights, your best ideas, put everything out there and hold nothing back. And specifically, like look to answer your client's questions. Like one of the things whenever we're talking to our customers and onboarding, we're always like, they're like, okay, well, what should we create first? I'm like, just think through like the past several con client conversations. Like, what are people asking you? Like, what are you consistently just re-explaining to your customers? Like that their mindsets or maybe like some belief structure that they like you're having to like change within them. Like that's where I look to for like the best content is like that starting point. Because if, if you're already explaining something to your customers on a regular basis, then that's like a great piece of content. Because then like you can explain it and they'd be like, oh, and I have this piece to back it up. And so literally like I kind of operate, you know, like I just keep a backlog of content ideas and it literally just comes from the phone calls I have and just saying like, oh, okay. Um, they asked me this question. I'm going to add that. I'm going to make an article. And sometimes I'll, if it's a really good prospect, I'll like spin up an article really fast and be like, oh, we have this article on our site about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally just wrote it to an answer to like right. the discussion point or the objective. You wrote it the night before, 15 minutes yep. after the call. Yep. I agree with that. I think the best way that you can create content is, of course, through the conversations you're having and then through the questions that are being asked online about your industry, right? That they know the market tells you what they're interested in. It's, it's more about them than what you think is interesting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's like, that's why answering the questions, it just removes is that kind of bias because without that a lot of times people will write things that make sense to you but maybe not to your customer not and when it's like okay what are the questions your customers are asking you that immediately puts you in that like value driving kind of mindset and framework to how you approach it absolutely and one of the things you mentioned on valuable content holding nothing back i think for people that are have checked out your website and if you haven't and you're a listener you should check it out one of the things you talk about a lot about is the 
is how you deal mentally with the pressure and the responsibility of being a CEO and running a company. Um, so it was, I, I wanted to ask you, what are, are your thoughts on the mental, on, on the importance of how you approach mentally your role as a CEO and how you deal with all, with all the fires that come out and how you manage them? Yeah, well, I think the biggest things that you know, my advisor said to me and just one of the biggest things I've just learned is like your business is a reflection of yourself. And like your journey as an entrepreneur is largely tied to your journey as an individual and just self-improvement. And so literally like getting better at being disciplined with a healthy diet and workout, like make me better at work, you know, having a better relationship with my wife makes me better at work. Meditating every day makes me like better working on music in my free time, all of these things and becoming like disciplined and focused and like, becoming a well-rounded person and also elevating as a leader. Um, it's like your personal growth, like your business in like the level you're at is like almost like a parallel to like the mindset in like the current level, like where you are. And if you find yourself like frustrated, like why is my business not doing better? It's like, well, it's probably because I need to be doing better. Right. And there's like things I need to learn or skills I need to gain or stuff like that. And whenever I just kind of committed to that and just like, I pour a ton into personal growth and improvement. And like, as I just keep doing that, like it just, the, the bar just keeps rising every year. Good and ROI, right? Yeah. It's it, like, there's, yeah, there's a phenomenal kind of framework where it's like, um, you know, debating, should you invest in like personal development or like put your money in the stock market? And well, in the current situation with Corona, I think we yeah. know where the better investment would be, but it's interesting, even if you look at like the long-term investment, but it's like, okay, if I put five grand into like the stock market, I know I'm going to get like this slow and steady, like, mm -hmm. you know, seven to 8% return every year. Do I think I could get a better return if I spent five grand on like training myself or leveling myself up and maybe grew my company by like 50% next year? Like. That's like an interesting angle to look at that you can get a better ROI investing in yourself. Yeah. What, what are some of those examples of you going outside and investing in yourself? Um, yeah. I, from day one of Lead Cookie, I hired a business coach and advisor and literally worked with him um, and extensively for the per first about seven months and then kind of on and off throughout the process as I needed kind of help with growth. Uh, I've done a ton with kind of a, a personal development program as well as kind of more like outside of business, but full well-roundedness um, invest into just uh, like even into music stuff. Like I put money into that as like a hobby because it like gives me this creative outlet and stuff. What, what do you, what do you do in music? Uh, I make like EDM music. So oh, really? uh, yeah, I've got awesome. Ableton and, and a bunch of plugins and just make, um, you know, trippy. Cool. I write raps. So I also, all right, all right. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Nice. I'm, I'm in like the, the heavy, heavier yeah. genre, even <laughs> glitch mob kind of stuff. So. It doesn't. And tell me about writing. Cause I think that's um, one of the things we, that we share in common. You put out the daily in your website as well. Um, tell me what writing does for you. I guess mentally, not just professionally, but, but more mentally and, and emotionally as well. Yeah. So one of the biggest things is like, it, it kind of, there, there's actually one of the, the daily, like the daily where that comes from, which I've actually like paused it due to Corona. Cause like I keep those things backlogged for like months right. uh, and I was like, I don't want anything insensitive publishing yeah, yeah. right now. But, um, the, uh, I still write them every day. Mm -hmm. What I do is it's kind of a process called like discover and declare where you, I basically learn something every day and then I rewrite what I learned. Right. And so every day I have a learning kind of part of my morning routine and then I'll write something maybe from that. Maybe it's just from something I kind of learned a revelation from the previous day. And that kind of helps me solidify my learnings in my mind. When you teach something to someone else, it solidifies it in your own mind. And that's the other great thing about articles. Like uh, even that, like avoid this mistake when hiring a salesperson. It's, it's like, God, I'm like itching to hire one for content allies, but I know it's not locked in enough yet. And so right. it's like that blog becomes this reminder of like, Hey, about last time you screwed this up. <laughs> like, it's true. And, yeah. And so it's, it, it literally becomes this like log of the things you learned. And, and that's not to say that every post is like perfect. I have some things I look back at, I wrote, uh, I wrote years ago. I'm like, I probably actually don't agree with that anymore. But right. it, at the time it was where my head was and um, you know, you're not perfect with it, but it's, it's super valuable and it just solidifies learnings in my mind whenever I write stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. For me, writing was my way out. And 
and my beginnings as an entrepreneur because I started as a freelance ghostwriter. But before that, I was just putting out content on Quora and, and Medium and and those couple million views that I got in six months was my beginnings of people coming inbound and wanting to work with me and my first taste of personal branding, I guess, in, in retrospect. But what has worked best for me has been for my mental health because it's been a very therapeutic experience for me to be able to just take my thoughts in my brain and put them out on the paper and not having to think them out loud anymore. Yeah, to- totally agree with that. And it's like, and I, whenever I tell someone, they're like, not sure they're like uh, they're all like overthinking and i'm like just write and put stuff out there and like at some point you just like what you put out there and like and there's like the market and then it's like what does the market actually like and enjoy uh and so like you find this stuff and eventually like i had things early on that like i thought were gonna just be massive and like people would love and like no one cared yeah. and and then i've had other things where i just like wrote stuff and it was like skip massive responses and engagement, but you just kind of learn over time so I always talk about that. I think my, my most viewed post was after three beers at 2 a.m. And then other, <laughs> other things that I think are perfect, then they never blow up, right? So you ne- you cannot time what goes viral and what doesn't. So yeah. a couple of questions that, and then when, just before we wrap this up, one of the things that I struggle and that I wanted to hear from you is what makes a good leader and what do you think, or, or what are you struggling the most as well when it comes to managing people? Yeah, I think it's, there's so much to learn in the leadership role, but like the biggest thing is if you're evolving and growing, then like people will look up to you and like people there is like, there's a rule that like people don't quit bad jobs, they quit bad management. And like, it's crazy how many poor leaders there are, but if you are consistently growing and expanding and you're consistently pushing toward a bigger and better future, like that is what that is what everyone wants. Like that is like inherent in like, if you go into like, like Joseph Campbell's, like the hero's journey, like everyone wants a bigger and better future in some level, even if it's not more money, even if it's just more freedom or happiness. And if they see you as a leader pushing toward that and constantly growing and evolving and like aiming for things that like inspire you, that's inspiring for them. And they like want to get on board for that journey. And so I think that's one of the biggest things is like, if, you know, if you're just a leader and you're just like, like I've, I've met some entrepreneurs where like they treat their team like crap and like right. they don't really care. They're just in it for the money and they're really selfish. But like, I don't know, for me, I just, I'm growing and expanding. I'm really transparent with my team. I try to treat them fairly. And like, I feel like that just creates a great like culture that people want to be around and stuff. So just don't be an ass and like keep pushing for growth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's simple, but complicated at the same time, right? Because, and it's also a, a hard balance. I was just reading this article on your website of a smart businessman versus compassion, right? And mm-hmm. making sure you're doing the right decisions for your business, but also taking care of the people. And I do think there's some middle point that we all should strive to get there and we want, but we should keep trying anyway. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah. And again, like that's the, that's the hard part is like with the team um, is you want to like care for your team and like be honest and transparent. I think this is what I love about transparency is like just being really clear and stuff and just being open. I'm like huge for transparency because like, you know, you want to treat your team well, you want to have good relationships, but like, then like the, the, the hard part of that is like you hit points where it's like, you know, as you grow as a company, like, you don't actually at, at like what you need at like five people is not what you always need at like 20. Right. And there was a period at lead cookie or I remember like, we were like these jobs that we're staffing in the U S like we can probably do this in the Philippines. And that was like this really hard thing of being like, Oh shit. Like right. this is like the smart Fuck. business decision, <laughs> but I have to have some really shitty conversations right now. And like, those are like the not fun things to where like, you have this like, yeah, you have all the emotions, all the relationships around this. And that's just like being clear and transparent with people. And it's not easy. Like it's still not easy. Like they're going to get upset, but like that, that is this hard part of being an entrepreneur to balance that relationships with your team with just doing the right business thing at the same time. Makes sense. It's definitely not easy. Uh, and then the, the last question that I wanted to ask you, if you, could go, could turn back the clock and talk to when you were 22, 23, 
what would you tell yourself in advance of the next eight, 10 years? Uh, quit smoking so much weed and, <laughs> uh, and get yourself that's, sturdy. That's the stable. key, right? That's the key. Yeah. To <laughs> uh, yeah. Not to say like you can't, but I crashed and burned and probably delayed my progress by being just a chaotic individual that was all over the place. And uh, if I would have invested more into learning myself and getting my own head straight. Um, and just like realizing that like the problem isn't out there, the problem's in you right. and realizing that it's on you to change yourself. If you want to change your future, like that is like, I just kept being like, Oh, like something's next. Something's coming. Like, why are these things not working? And it's, it was just like, it was some point in my like mid to, I was probably like 26, 27 when like things started really going well, like I was making it as a consultant, but it was just like at that point when like, I just kind of like hit this point of like, I know I'm capable of more. Right. I feel like I should have accomplished more in this point in my life, but I'm not. And so something's wrong here. Right. And I got to like take some look at the hard facts that like, even though I think I'm like pretty damn smart, the facts of my bank account and like my <laughs> lifestyle don't show it. Right. And like, that was this like turning point of like, I got to get my shit together. Like, and um, that involves sobering up a lot of different life changes and things and stuff there. But um yeah that was like probably a very big turning point where i feel like had i hit that a few years earlier um i probably would be further along even than i am right now that's awesome well jake thank you so much for spending the time to be here um if you want to listen to a great podcast stop listening to this one and go listen to working <laughs> with fans <laughs> thank you working without fans yeah yeah <laughs> without fans yeah and then for lead generation, lead cookies, your place to go. If you want to create content, go to Influence Podium, not Content Alice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's all. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Jake, for being here. Um, if you're listening, subscribe, share, or don't, whatever. Uh, but Jake, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on here, Marty. Absolutely. All right, guys. This is a wrap. Goodbye. <laughs>